good morning. How is everybody? I guess it's afternoon there. So thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. I am absolutely thrilled uh, to be able to share this information with you. We are going to go through a webinar in three parts at the end of each section. I will give some time for Q&A, so please put your comments or your questions into uh, the group chat. And before I forget, I want to remind you all to please, if you're interested in this topic or anything else uh, regarding leadership or coaching, please connect with me on LinkedIn. All of my best material is given away for free to my followers on LinkedIn, so please connect with me there. And I'm very happy to connect with you and, and to if there's anything that I can do to improve the quality of your life, that is what I'm on the planet for. So. Thank you so much for uh, for joining me. I am really thrilled about this conversation. I want to spend about an hour with you talking about the niche and nuances of the C-suite. I have been uh, an executive coach for 15 years. I've been in strategy for more than 30 years. I've started and exited my own companies. Now I coach for the C-suite in large multinational organizations. And I want to try and add some light to the HR uh, profession in terms of executive coaching, especially in this area of the world. I'm based in Dubai. I know the majority of you are in India. So in this area of the world, executive coaching is kind of a newer thing. And there's a lot of confusion in the market because coaching, executive coaching is not regulated. There's not a single coaching body that says, oh, this is what coaching is and this is how to measure it. So I want to try to add some, uh, let's say some, some, uh, some ammunition to your stockpile as an HR professional when you're talking with your executives about executive coaching and specifically the differences that are required uh, in, the, in the, the acumen of the coach when they're coaching C-suite level executives versus C-1. So you're gonna hear me re refer to that quite a, quite a lot. I'll say CXO, and CXO means anyone on the C-suite, so Chief Executive Officer, Chief Operating Officer, CHRO, uh, CDO, CIO, CFO, all of those things. If the title starts with C, that's a CXO. Uh, anyone below that, so deputy CX, deputy CEO, deputy CFO, deputy CHRO, that's C-1. Okay, so this, this gap between CXO and C-1 is the gap that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to do this in three sections. The first section, I'm going to talk about the seven differentiators between coaching as CXO and C-1. Then we'll take some Q&A. Then I'll, then I'll go through a few case studies that highlight these seven principles. Uh, after those five case studies, we'll take more Q&A. And if we have time at the end of the hour, we're going to go into ROI. And I will give you four uh, tools for calculating the return on investment for executive coaching at the CXO level. You can use any four of those tools. And uh, best news ever, I am going to give you for free, if you want it, your very own copy of my ebook called um, The Chief Executive Coach, The Niche and Nuances of Coaching the Corner Office. So you'll see there at the bottom right hand corner, this will appear from time to time. There's a little QR code, please feel free to use the QR code. Uh, just go to the website and put in your name. I don't want to spam you if you don't want the book, but if you want the ebook that covers all of the information from today, including the ROI calculations, please take it for free. It's there and it's available for you. I'm just really happy to have the conversation going because I think coaching as it rises is, uh, is going to be well, ultimately, one of the biggest differentiators on the planet in terms of the effectiveness of our leadership and specifically at the executive level. So why is the CXO coach such a critical role? These are the seven principles, which I'm going to talk about in section one here. Number one, CXOs are among the best business players on the planet and all of the best players and all of the best games have coaches. Secondly, CXOs often navigate their first shift from an offensive to a defensive career position when they reach the C-suite. I'll illuminate that in a couple of minutes. CXOs find themselves uh, very often alone. You've heard that it's lonely at the top and I will describe what that means in terms of coaching as well. Uh, CXOs often need to translate from a departmental language that they've learned their entire career into other departmental languages and they struggle with that for the very first time in their careers once they, once they reach that C-suite level. Uh, five, CXOs are only completely transparent with a coach that is committed to complete confidentiality. And this highlights the needs for, for external coaches at the CXO level where internal coaches probably are not going to get the same sort of efficacy. Uh, number six, CXO uh, require multidisciplinary coaches. And I'll talk about the disciplines that are required. And number seven, CXOs make high 
stakes decisions. And those high stakes decisions can cost the company millions uh, or benefit the company millions. If, um, if, the, if the coach is doing well, then the CXO is doing well, and that can make or break your bottom line, and that can definitely widen your margin. So let's go through each of these seven things. Number one, you're dealing with Olympic level talent. Okay, I want you to think about coaching like you would think about coaching. There is no industry in the world where the top talent doesn't have coaches. The top violin players in the world all have coaches. The top surgeons in the world all have co coaches. The top MMA fighters have an army of coaches. Uh, and that is true of the top business people as well. The majority of the FTSE 100 and Fortune 500 CXOs all have executive coaches. That is very often how they got there. And that is that is most likely how they're going to remain there. So this is the truth of everything. And I think from its very basic level, you'll see the truth of this, that there is no such thing as an Olympic athlete that doesn't have an Olympic level coach that is required. And it is one of the truths of, of human nature that we perform at our natural best when we're in community with someone that knows the game we're playing and can help us to improve our performance. So that is true in every human domain. Now, I've heard it said that anyone can learn to coach anyone in anything, and I think that's abjectly untrue. And I think for most of our organizations at the CXO level, if you do not have the right kind of coach at that level, it is a very, very dangerous game to play. And business is the only industry in the world where I find this narrative that anyone with a basic certification in coaching uh, can be a non-advisory coach to a CXO and improve the bottom line. And I really don't see any data backing that up. Uh, I don't see the research on that. In fact, what I'm going to present to you today is research quite in opposition to that. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think it's unfair to our CXOs in our large multinational organizations um, that we're putting in front of them coaches that really don't have a lot of business acumen or a lot of psychology acumen, and they're just asking um, rhetorical or non-advisory questions. And it tends to become very frustrating for the CXOs. And what happens is those CXOs say, well, look, coaching really isn't for me. It's not adding a lot of value. Uh, and that is because they've not interacted with the right kind of or right quality of coach. When you are dealing with an Olympic level athlete, you must provide them with an Olympic level coach. Okay, so that's the argument we're going to make first. Secondly, um, one of the reasons why your CXOs need an Olympic level coach is because for the very first time in their career, when you shift from C minus one to CXO, very often that is the first time in your career that you end up in a defensive career position. So you think about it like uh, you think about an, uh, an accountant, for example, growing up in the finance department, the accountant starts an accountant and they're, they're facing up, you know, they want to become an, a finance manager and then a deputy CFO at some point, And they're always facing up, always facing up, always facing up. And then it, suddenly in their career, they, you know, there's five candidates for CFO and they win. OK, they win and they become the CFO of the organization that they've always wanted to become CFO of. They get into that role and there's no more rungs on the ladder. Okay, this is the first time in their career that they've ever faced this paradigm, right? You look up and there's nothing there, right? There, there's the CEO position, but from a finance perspective, this is it. You're the CFO. You're the highest level of finance in that organization. So there's no more rungs on the corporate ladder in this organization. You're going to have to leave the economic tribe in order to find a another ladder. But still, if you're going to move from CFO to CFO, you're always going to be at the top of the ladder, which means... Instead of being one of five people looking up and chasing that top level finance position in the organization, now as the first time CFO, you're looking down at four other qualified people that want your job. And very often, if they're not aware of that, this shift from C minus one to CXO can lead um, executives to, to move into a defensive career posture. Well, now that I've now that I've become CFO, I need to remain CFO and they become very protectionistic. And that's where silos can really develop if the leader themselves are not um, uh, not aware of this change, not nuanced enough in understanding their own behavior to, uh, to manage that kind of shift. So the shift to defense is a very big shift. Most CXOs are not aware of it. And a good coach knows these things and knows how to draw it out and to help them to remain collaborative and, um, uh, and empowering in spite of that very human, very real and very common tendency. Number three, 
is, uh, sorry, it's lonely at the top. And you've heard this before, it's lonely at the top. And that's actually pretty true. If you talk to your CXOs, again, if we look at the, at the finance function as an example, you have an accountant that grows to finance manager, then finance controller and deputy CFO, and then suddenly this, they're the CFO. Once they become the CFO, they're the highest level of finance in the organization. And for the very first time in their career, which may have been 20 or 30 years long before they reach that position, there's no one more competent than them in the organization. Generally speaking, once you reach that level, there's no one else to talk to for help. Even as the deputy CFO, if you have a question about something, if you're not sure about a beta calculation on evaluation, for example, you go to your CFO. You say, hey, what do you think about this? And the CFO, generally speaking, is more competent in those things and can advise you. There's somebody in the organization that's a little bit better than you in your area of competency that can help with that advisory role. Once you reach CFO, that's not there anymore. So who do you talk to for advice? When the CFO is questioning their own judgment about something, they need to speak out loud about it. They can't talk to the CEO. They can't say, hey, I feel insecure about this calculation. I feel like maybe I don't have the acumen necessary to produce this valuation or look at that M&A. There's there, that, those insecurities, they end up sitting inside the leader and they can bubble up in a lot of really different unhealthy ways. But that idea that it's lonely at the top really just highlights the need for an executive to have a coach, just like a like an Olympic athlete has an Olympic coach. Having somebody next to you to talk about your tactics, that even if the coach can't play the game as well as the athlete, the coach knows the game. Okay, so the coach needs to know the game, even though they can't play as well as their athlete. And it's the same with CXO coaching. I know the game. I don't play as well as my players do, but I coach at their level. And that's a really huge distinction for CXOs that feel lonely at the top because at that level, they can't admit to each other what kind of uh, insecurities they might be carrying um, or what kind of mistakes they might be worried about making. So instead they bury them, they hide them, or in the best case scenario, they talk them through with their coach. And I can tell you a good deal of my time with my coachees is actually spent in this area, just helping them to not feel lonely at the top, helping them to talk out ideas, strategies, tactics. Uh, and I become a sounding board for the kinds of things that they want to do as an executive athlete. The next one, translating competency. And I can't stress this enough. There's This happens all the time. Okay, so we take, um, for example, the IT function. Most of our organizations have an IT function, and it starts out with somebody in cybersecurity or uh, managing just d managing accounts in IT, and then slowly they become like an IT manager, then they become maybe a development manager, a product owner, and then they become the deputy CDO or CIO of the organization, and then they're you know the head of IT for a business unit, and then suddenly, boom, they're the CDO, they're the chief digital officer and then suddenly now they're the, the highest level of uh of competency digital competency in the organization and when that first time cdo steps onto the executive committee right so they're surrounded now now rather than having just a team of digital people their their team includes um the the cfo the chro uh the cmo maybe coo and the ceo right like all of these different c-suite people that grew up themselves in different departmental vertical languages. So the first time CDO first presenting their strategy to the executive committee for the very first time, what do they want to do? They want to add value. They want to prove that they were the right hiring choice, that the, that the, the committee that pulled them up into the CDO role did a really good job. And so they're going to display their competency. And they display their competency in which language? Their home language, the language of IT. And I had this case uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, massive multinational company, 70 years old, 55,000 employees, brand new CDO, okay? So the CDO gets, gets hired, gets pulled in, and says, the CEO says, I want to see your strategy for digital transformation for the organization. He says, great. You know, two weeks later, he comes in with 75 slides on a PowerPoint, okay? He presents his strategy, he's so proud of it, presents the strategy, and at the end, the CEO goes, goes I, I'm, I don't really understand all of that. Can you maybe, you know, uh, make it a little more clear and then come back in a couple of weeks? And the CEO goes, yeah, definitely, that's great. I'm so excited to make this even more clear. 
Two weeks later, the CDO came back with 120 slides, more technical language, more development in vocabulary that really only belongs to the digital competency. Uh, and the CEO was completely alienated. CFO had absolutely no idea what the CDO was talking about. And then the CDO was really frustrated with, with the lack of support from his executive committee members. And he's like, why do my team not understand me? So that's when the CEO and the CFO called me they pulled me and they said, hey, listen, this guy needs some coaching in language. So I went and just sat with him and I said, listen, what you're doing is great. You're displaying your competency, you're adding value, but you're adding it in a language that none of your teammates speak. They don't understand all of this technical jargon. They don't, they can't read any of the details. They didn't grow up in the IT department. So I'm gonna help you translate all of the impact of what you're doing here into HR language, finance language, operational language. And I'll tell you what, he went back to them a couple of weeks later um, with a 16 slide deck, got complete and full support, a full budget for everything that he wanted to, uh, to execute because he was able to translate it into other languages. And a good deal of time, uh, our CXOs are not aware that that's what's happening. So from a finance perspective, the CFO speaks only in finance. From an HR perspective, this, the brand new CHRO speaks only in terms of people and culture and values. Well, the CFO doesn't understand that, doesn't value that. What makes the CFO great at being a CFO is not people and culture and values, it's numbers and profitability. So if, if the CHRO can't translate what they're doing into finance language, then it's not going to work very well. But nobody teaches our CXOs how to do that. And a good deal of the miscommunication that happens on the executive committee is because exactly that. A really good coach knows that. We know the game well enough to know, hey, I don't think the problem is actually interpersonal. I think it's language. So that's that just highlights. So translating competency is a really big um, missed opportunity, I think, in executive committee communi communications, and it leads to a lot of inefficiencies in our organizations. Imagine what we could do if all of our decks were just 16 slides instead of 120. Uh, next one is external confidentiality. So external internal coaches uh, will never, ever achieve the level of authenticity and transparency that an external coach will, first of all. And an external coach that has the trust of a CXO will hear everything. I can tell you this after a couple of decades in executive coaching, my clients tell me everything. I know all of the political plays in the organization. I know all of the all of the executives that are looking to leave. I know six months before they're going to resign that they're intending to resign. I know I hear about their family lives. I hear about their children. I hear about the people that they're trying to take out in the organization that they're actually trying to get other people fired. And I hear everything that would never happen. If I was an internal coach, an internal coach is subject to uh, the the employee handbook, the organizational structure, um, the, the code of conduct in the organization. I am not. I am subject to the regulations of the um, the regulations and the laws of the country in which I operate. But because I'm an external service provider, I am not subject to the code of conduct uh, or or even the ethics policy of the organizations that I serve. That allows a CXO to be transparent and authentic with me about gray margin decisions that they may be considering. Things that might be unethical, maybe not unethical, but they need to talk it out. They, and who do they talk to? How do they discuss those things? How do they process that information? Well, more often than not, they do it with me. And that means that they have a higher level of coaching available to them because the coach isn't required by the policy manual to say, hey, I was coaching the CEO, the CEO has indicated that they're planning to resign in six months from now, that can have a massive impact on our stock uh, and our valuation, and therefore we need to take you know, initial action to inform the board that the CEO is intending to resign. We can't, we can't allow that to happen. If we don't get the authenticity from our CXOs that they need with their coaches, then we're never, never gonna be able to coach them at their best. And so when I do understand that you know, CXOs are intending to resign in six months from now, I help them to manage those transitions ethically, you know, positively, making sure that the, the organization doesn't feel the impact of their loss. And, uh, and that's something that an internal coach can never do. Right, one size doesn't fit all. And again, I'm going to go back to that rumor that anyone can coach anyone in anything. That is abjectly false. Just because you can coach football doesn't mean you can coach an Olympic football team. 
Okay, it doesn't it's and just because you can teach or just because you can coach a violin player doesn't mean you can coach a concert violin player. Like it 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 makes sense when you say it out loud. Um, there are uh, coaching certification industries around the world that have tried to say that anyone can become an executive coach. It's just a matter of learning to ask the right questions. And that is absolutely untrue and very dangerous at the CXO level. Once a coach is operating at the CXO level, the kinds of questions that we ask of our CXOs and the kinds of decisions that they make as a result of those questions and a result of the, the advisory input that they receive from us, those can be million dollar decisions. Okay, so it's not the same. You can't just take a coach from anywhere and put them in front of a uh, the CEO of a company of 50,000 employees and expect that CEO to make higher quality decisions. It's simply untrue. Um, CXOs, uh, CXO coaches at, at this level really need to be business trained. So my recommendation for my clients, if they're looking for somebody who's who's coaching at a CXO level, at a very, very minimum, you need 10 years of executive role experience, um, a master's in business administration or something like that. So you understand the business game, you have to understand the game well enough, and you have to have 10 years of coaching experience to coach at the CXO level. So 10 years of coaching, 10 years of business, and at least an MBA in terms of education. Your CXO's coach should also be a thought leader. So if your CXO's coach isn't achieving a certification, doing a doing an academic degree or writing an academic article, uh, publishing a book uh, within the last 18 months, then probably they're slowly becoming irrelevant. So your coach needs to operate like kind of a professor, halfway between a professor and a business coach. Um, they should be consistently improving their body of knowledge and their toolkit. And that brings us to the last one. Number seven, our CXOs are usually responsible for the highest risk decisions in all of our organizations. Most of our organizations, they have um, an authority matrix that allows minor decisions to be made by, by uh, mid-level management roles, but the highest risk decisions are always taken at the CXO level. And if your CXO is being influenced by a coach that doesn't understand business, or doesn't understand um, how to how to increase the quality of decision making behavior, or to increase the quality of thought life, or how to uh, how to help your CXO work on time and task management, or attention mastery and focus. Yeah, you're not going to get the highest quality decisions out of your CXOs. They are not robots. They are not machine parts. They are not resources, and they are not capital. They are just humans, and sometimes we forget that, and uh, that's a really dangerous thing. So if you're if you're setting your CXOs in front of underqualified coaches, that's a very high risk decision already. And my, my recommendation to you would be to make sure that your CXOs coach is qualified at the same level of play as your CXO. So again, an Olympic coach doesn't have to play the game as well as their athlete can, but they have to understand the game just as well, if not better than their athlete does. Okay. So that's, uh, the end of the first section. I want to make sure that you all have the opportunity to grab that QR code, grab this ebook. I go into more detail in the ebook, and I believe I'm going to expand this into a, a like a published work by the end of the year. But I want to give you the sneak preview, and I would be very happy to receive any comments you have on this um, through LinkedIn. But first of all, I want to open the floor up to questions. Are there any questions uh, that I can answer for you at the moment? So, Dr. Curry, um, I uh, don't know if they're spe specific to this segment, but there are a couple of questions, if I can sure. read out to you at this point. Uh, yeah, please so go ahead. Question on, um, you know, the kind of uh, asking you to uh, share some examples of unique challenges that a C-suit executive typically faces and how, and how coaching can help address them. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, that is actually the subject of the next section. So I'm going to save that question for last because I'm going to answer that in the next section. We're going to go through five really interesting case studies. Sure. Another one is also on um, how do you establish credibility and build trust with high-level executives uh, as you coach them? Yeah, this is actually, it's a really good thing. First of all, I have to understand, first of all, they I have to have a big enough profile that they're going to let me in the office. Okay, CXOs of companies of 5,000 employees or more, they have a lot of demands on their time. Okay, anything that they give 60 to 90 minutes to has to be unbelievably important. 
Because if I, if I, for example, if I walk into my CXO's office and I say, and I sit down and I say, what do you think you should do? And what haven't you tried? And, you know, what are the tactics that you haven't employed? And how have you not thought about it? If I take a purely non-advisory coaching approach to my CXOs, they'll kick me out of the office immediately. In most cases, uh, that's a $10,000 hour. Why would, why, would, why would somebody who has that many demands on their time and is required to make that volume of, of decisions, high volume decisions, why would they permit someone to sit in their office for an hour and not add value? That is, so for me, the, the biggest part of building credibility is building myself. My, my history, my acumen, my thought leadership, I am consistently sharpening my own tools so that when I walk into the office to sit down with a CXO, they see me walking in with a huge warehouse of sharp tools. I know, I, I, I listen to what they, what they want and I have something to try. I'm never without a tactic or a strategic idea. And I say things like, oh, you know what? We tried this at Microsoft and it worked. Or we tried this at the United Nations and it worked. Have you, have you tried this? But I don't just say, have you, what haven't you tried? I say, have you tried this? Because I've seen this work and I know this research and I understand this development in the industry. So going in prepared, I think, is the most important thing in terms of establishing credibility. You need to ask yourself as an HR professional, why would your CXO trust that particular coach? First of all, it's profile. Secondly, it's it's um, communication skills. And a lot of it is just active listening, making sure that my ears are open and my mouth is shut. <laughs> uh, sure. So um, Sanjay uh, Jain is asking if uh, I'm a sales, so he's a CHRO, so he's asking uh, how do I convince uh, management or promoter to initiate coaching program and company for CXO? That's a really, really good question. I think the best motivation is money. Um, look, you, you, there's a couple of shorthands for that. I'm going to give you four or ROI calculations at the end of this webinar, or at least in the ebook, um, if we don't get there. But most CFOs and CEOs at the moment in, in Western Europe and North America, they know, right? Olympic athletes need Olympic coaches. They get it. They're investing because it's profitable. Here in this area of the world, we're, we're not exposed to, that, to the industry as well. And so it's a kind of a slower burn. You're right. HR professionals need to get in front of their CXOs and say, hey, I want to add something else to your task list that's going to cost you about 90 minutes every other week or at least every month. And a CXO, just to, just to put another 90 minute meeting into their schedule every month as a massive mental cost, they have to know that there's going to be a benefit to that, right? So having the tools to explain to a CXO why they need coaching and why it's profitable is, is really, really important. The seven reasons that I went to before is usually where I start. I, I, uh, I encourage HR professionals to go to their CXOs and say, listen, I think you're really talented. I think you're amazing at what you do. You might be an Olympic level player in this industry. Let's get you an Olympic level coach and see what happens. A lot of CXOs will be tickled by that idea. Um, right now across uh, the MENA and, and, um, and India, uh, there's, there's still this kind of conflation of coaching with therapy, right? If you get a coach, it's because you're broken and you need to be fixed, but that's not true. If you're broken and you need to be fixed, you need a therapist. That is not my job. My job is to take talented athletes and turn them into Olympians. Okay, that's the job of a coach. And that differentiation needs to be made. You are not broken. You do not need to be fixed. You are an Olympic potential athlete. And so we need to get you in front of an Olympic level coach. And if that's the narrative, like, hey, you've reached, uh, in a lot of the organizations that I work in, what they do is they include it as a benefit at a certain level of um, uh, a grade level, right? So in some organizations, it's grade seven or grade 13, depending on which, you know, model they're using. And so, the, you know, once they reach that level, deputy CEO or deputy CXO or something, then they're informed, hey, by the way, one of the benefits that goes along with being at this level is you have access to a qualified executive coach. Here's a lineup of coaches. Why don't you pick the three that you want to meet with? We'll set up a meeting and then you can choose the one you want to partner with. Um, and make sure that uh, the boards of directors understand this as well. If you're trusting the management of an organization that large, with that many people involved, with that many resources involved, with that much um, market value and share value at stake, 
you're going to want the person or the people that are responsible for the highest risk and influential decisions, you're going to want them to be coached. You need them to perform consistently at their very best. And the only way humans perform consistently at their very best is with a coach in any industry. All right. Um, what is there another question? Uh, there is one, but before that, I like to, uh, you know, convey to you a feedback that has come in. Uh, so Evoli says sure. that these are very interesting aspects that you have been sharing, Dr. Corey. So thank you for yes. being crisp and clear with your insights. Um, I'll take the last question of this segment, Dr. Corey. Uh, so uh, Chayan is asking, how do the coach make the language transformation shift for CXOs to understand what they want to convey? Um. Yeah, I don't know that an HR, I don't know that the HR team can do that. I think that has to be somebody on the C-suite or an executive coach that helps them to understand the language shift challenge. Um, most of the most of the CXOs that I that I talk to don't they don't ever see that. They don't know that that's what's actually happening. They're just really confused. They're, so CHROs, for example, will become CHRO, but the CHRO grew up in the HR function almost all of the time, right? They started out as a recruiter and then they became like an HR manager, then an HR business partner, uh, then maybe head of LND, and then eventually they become deputy CHRO and then CHRO, right? But then as soon as they get to CHRO, they've got all of this HR strategy that they want to add value with. It's not evil or malicious. It's actually quite the opposite. So they get there to this to the to the executive committee and they want to display their competency and display their value and they add value in a foreign language and then they're then they're very disheartened very confused when the cfo consistently nails at them what about the roi what about the net profit what is where is the business use case and the chro typically has grown up their entire career not speaking finance language so for them it becomes really disheartening and they walk away feeling really like marginalized or rejected in some cases, and that can lead to interpersonal conflict that isn't necessary. So most of the time, what happens is in those translation issues, they don't know it. They, they can't see it. Nobody's raised that to their attention. When a coach comes in and says, hey, listen, you're, you know, you're playing with players who grew up in different kinds of the game, you know, we need to translate into their language. That, that's a new thing and typically very uncomfortable. What makes CHROs typically great at HR is that they're good with people, right? And they love people. Well, that's a very different set of skills from what makes a CFO really great at finance. What makes people really traditionally very good with finance makes them terrible with people. And we need that, it's balance, right? But if that balance isn't understood and valued, then it can become conflict. So the, the biggest thing, um, the biggest challenge is helping them to become aware of it. And then the next challenge, of course, is helping to coach them through the translation issues and uh, to move their language into other departmental languages. Sure, I think we can move on to the next segment, Dr. Kori. I'll park the other question for the next segment. Yeah, perfect. Because I remember your um, the first question you started out with was some stories. You wanted some stories of executives that are dealing with exactly the things that I'm talking about and to highlight the niche and nuances, those differentiators that we were discussing. And I want to tell you a few of the stories. Now, obviously, I can't tell you the names of the executives themselves or the organizations in which they work, but I'm going to tell you a few stories. And you'll see on each of these five slides, you'll see a list of um, the tools that I used. Some of them are from business. Some of them are from my own experience. Some of them are from psychology, like cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, narrative therapy, uh, neuro-linguistic programming. So I've actually made a highlight of the different kinds of tools that I've used to address each of these case studies. Now, the case study themselves um, are fairly dramatic. This is <laughs> the overwhelmed GCHRO. So I had the C uh, group chief human resources officer. By group, I mean 50,000 employees plus, okay? Very large multinational organization. Um, she's the GCHRO. And so I was her executive coach and she brought me in. This was a, a, a while ago. And she said, listen, um, I mean, we'd already built rapport and everything, but then finally, when she trusted me, which is about two or three months in, she said, hey, I've got a problem. I said, what is it? She goes, talent retention. 
And I said, okay, she's like, I have this talent retention KPI. I need to meet it. I'm doing my best to try to get people to stay in. But the biggest problem is I'm planning to leave. And I was like, okay, well, there's a, there's a hypocritical error there, obviously. And she says, yeah, absolutely. She says, how can I, how, how can I authentically try to retain talent when I can't even retain myself. You know, we have these political challenges in the organization. I'm looking for other opportunities I want to develop because I've been in this role for a few years and I want to move to maybe a different ladder or a different organization or maybe to start my own company. And, and this really highlights to me as a coach her need for uh, executive coaching and the organization's need for the GCHRO to have an executive coach. If the GCHRO is having these kinds of authenticity and integrity challenges with their own talent retention program, who do they talk to about it? Do they go to the CEO? Do they go to the board of directors and say, hey, I'm thinking about leaving in six months, so I'm not quite sure what to do about the talent retention problem there. No, the GCHRO has no one, no one in their life that they can talk about it. Even if they have a therapist, the therapist doesn't understand these business implications. Right? And does the GCHRO, do they have an ethical responsibility to inform the board of directors that they're intending to leave in six months from now? No, they don't. It's a secret. It's a secret that influences the ability of the organization to care for 50,000 families. Okay? So it's a big deal. And so it was like, it was a big challenge, but we worked on seamless transitioning, making sure that all of her SVPs were equipped to uh, to handle everything that was on her plate that only she could do. And, and that was a big, big challenge as well, because we found out that she was micromanaging. She was micromanaging at the, at the, you know, the GCHRO level, but her SVPs were fully qualified to do the things that only she could do. So what we did was created an inventory of all of those things that she was doing, that she felt she was the only one that was equipped to do it. And then I called that her list of weaknesses. Each list, each item on that list needed to be eliminated. We need to eliminate every single thing that you are doing that you're the only one that can do. And over the period of a few months, we did that, eliminated all of those bottlenecks. What happened was her team, her SVP team and VP team, they all became unbelievably empowered. They were empowered. She trained them. She turned her attention from doing to teaching and, and into coaching. And then over a period of months, actually, she had very little, if anything at all to do. So when it came time for her to transition out, it was really seamless. She moved out, another replacement moved in, and the whole thing was moving very smoothly at the time when that transition happened. What it means is that the organization doesn't pay the, um, the missed opportunity or in, inefficacy costs of attrition at the highest level, which I'm sure that you all know the cost of attrition at the, at the CXO level is roughly two years of gross package, right? Gross total rewards. Um, well, this organization didn't have to pay that because there was it was all seamless. There was overlap in the transition. So the two uh, CHROs got to talk to each other. There was, there was a nice, smooth, firm handoff and the organization didn't feel the impact. So they saved in terms of bottom line finance, they saved two years of gross total rewards as a result of, well, as a result of the GCHRO having a coach that understood and was willing to lead them through a strategy of transition that would allow them to feel that they maintained their integrity, even though they couldn't retain their own talent. So that's case study number one. And yeah, that's bigger than a non-advisory coach can manage. So number two, uh, CEO's fear of the future. So I had this, this was about four years ago. I had a, a CEO of a um, an automotive group and the, it was really funny because he was, oh goodness, he was in his late fifties at the time, came to me and he said, listen, Corey, I, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? I was coaching him already. And he said, I've got a problem. My problem is, he says, I'm, I'm going to retire in about eight years. And I'm just not sure if I have a business model that's going to last that long. And I was like, well, what a thing to say, right? Like, you're the CEO and you don't know if you have a business model that's going to last eight years. And he says, he said, listen, I can't talk to anybody about this. I, you know, I can't talk to the board of directors. I can't talk to the executive committee. I can't tell them I don't understand artificial intelligence or blockchain or, or three-dimensional printing or all of these other fourth industrial revolution influences that are coming in to upset me in my industries. I have, I have a hard enough time dealing with electric vehicles and that transition. He says, I can't see the other stuff that's coming to knock the pillars out from under me. 
And I've got all of these families that I'm caring for, 6,000 families that I'm caring for. And I'm just afraid that at some point I'm going to realize or I'm going to, I'm going to be embarrassed in front of the world when I didn't see a massive disruption coming. And, uh, and it was really interesting because it was a very authentic, very transparent moment for this CEO who otherwise was an alpha male, apex predator type. They've, he's got nobody to be honest with. He said, look, I told my wife that I felt insecure about this, but she can't help me. She has no, no tools for that. And I can't tell the executive committee. I can't tell the board of directors that I'm incompetent or naive or, you know, or, or ignorant of something that's going on that might be this big. He said, I need a strategy. I need you to help me do that. Now, tell me, what kind of a coach do you need for an Olympic level athlete at that level who's saying, look, I, I think I might be disrupted out of the sport. I'm playing the sport like it's been played 10 years ago and the sport is changing and I don't know how to change with it. Well, you need an Olympic level coach that understands the sport and all of the changes that have been happening over the last 10 years so that they can help the athlete play at the new level of expectation. And that's exactly what I am. And that's exactly what I did. And I want you to find these coaches for your CXOs as well, because what we did was we created two strategies. One was an individual uh, disambiguation strategy for him. We created a strategy of learning, reading. He took a couple of academic courses to try and pick up some vocabulary and competency in business use case writing for artificial intelligence, especially in the automotive industry. And then we also created an event. And this was kind of a unique thing, right? I said, listen, there's no need for you to be um, highlighted in any way. But if you're concerned about this conversation in your organization, in your industry, why don't we create a three-day strategy event? So we hired this beautiful hotel, uh, brought in his 16 best and brightest, along with his executive committee and, and two members of the board of directors. And we sat them down. We brought industry experts, artificial intelligence experts, technology experts, futurists. And we, we discussed the forced industrial revolution and its impact on their industry and on their business and on their market. And then at the end of that three days, we had nine initiatives, uh, each of them with owners, milestones, dates, and a steward that was going to manage that, that um, implementation. All nine of those initiatives were implemented, by the way. They were all executed. The CEO is still right now in, uh, in his chair in that organization, and they have completely transformed their business model and their operations and their processes to make sure that they never get disrupted ever. So very happy about that. But again, that came from just having a coach that he trusted well enough to share his deepest, most bone rattling, anxiety driving insecurity. And a good deal of the time, that's what your CXOs really need. They need somebody around them that they can trust, that they can share their largest anxiety with, but they need somebody that has enough business acumen that they can speak intelligently into that anxiety. Case study three. Personal and professional crossroads. So this is a CEO um, of an organization, 35,000 employees, and he was managing a merger and acquisition. Um, so the merger and acquisition was a, was a company of just over 5,000 employees. So he was adding 5,000 to his 35,000. It was a fairly large deal. It was in the billions of dollars. And he was going through a divorce at the same time, and he had nobody to talk to about it. So I, he comes into actually, I've been coaching him for months. And so I sat down in his office and he said, uh, he said, look, we're, you know, I'm going through this m and I want to, you know, I want to talk about my thought life and focus and mindfulness. And I said, great, let's talk about all of those things. He said, and I said, why, why is this coming up today? What's the issue? And he says, my wife wants a divorce. You know, and I said, I said, okay, listen, this is the difference between a coach and a therapist. I said, have you talked to a therapist? He said, yeah, I've talked to a therapist. I have a therapist, but my therapist can't help me with this. My therapist can't give me tools for how do I sit down and read through a legal document that I've read through a dozen times to make sure that there's no mistakes in it when I've got 40,000 families on the line and a broken heart. How do I do that? Give me tools for that. And he was in tears like almost the entire time because he just doesn't have anybody else in his life that he can be authentic with. The therapist has no tools for business. And I do. So the tools came, a lot of it was from psychology, uh, positive psychology, cognitive behavioral th psychology, um, um, uh, neuroscience. I used a lot of neuroscience with him to try to create really practical strategies for helping him to focus and remain present and not compartmentalize his emotions, but to um, to budget the amount of energy that he was going to give to certain emotions when he was expressing them at the office, and to learn to walk 
in and out of conversations at the right time emotionally for him, because a lot of the responses that he was having at work were involuntary and amygdalic. If you don't know the name, if you don't know what those terms mean, it means you didn't, he wasn't thinking about it. He just like starts to become really emotional because it, well, because he's got a broken heart. He's got a broken heart and 40,000 families to feed. <laughs> like, tell me who's got a, a, a box of tools for that. Well, yeah, the Olympic level coach very often has to help their athlete to perform at their very best, in spite of the fact that personal things are going on in their personal lives, right? When a when a um, Olympic level tennis player is, you know, going through a, a breakup or a loss, they lose a parent during a, an Olympic, um, during the Olympic Games. Well, what what do you do? You turn to your coach, and the coach understands the game, but also understands the player. And the coach has enough tools in psychology and behavioral uh, modification and, and neuroscience very often to be able to help the athlete to perform at or near their very best in spite of these personal circumstances. But the CXO level in business has no one else to talk to. The CEO can't go to the executive committee and say, hey, you guys, I'm just not confident in my decision-making ability right now. I can't maintain focus. I'm going through something in my personal life that's bleeding into my decision-making quality. They can't tell the board of directors that. So who do they talk to? You need a certain coach with a level of acumen that is going to be able to hear those stories, understand them, and add value in that response. And yes, it was a very challenging case study, but we got him through that the M&A went well and he and his his wife ended up going to counseling and they're still together today but it was months of a lot of turmoil so yeah case study number four um generational leadership challenge so this was a group coaching challenge i had uh, a lot of the general managers more than 100 general managers for one of the largest hotel chains in the world and they got together um, and they wanted to learn about coaching from me and i was teaching them a coaching style of management but in that uh, in that workshop, we realized that actually what they wanted was they wanted to voice their frustration that they had employees leaving for very small differences in pay, usually around $100, depending on the market that they were talking about. So people are leaving the organization for about $100 difference in pay. And I said, you know, I said to them, listen, from a leadership perspective, if your people are leaving for a very minor salary, that means that you're just not that good of a leader, right? People will work for 23% less money if they're working in a job where they feel connected with their line manager and with the people that are working around them. So the problem wasn't financial, it was cultural. And so there was that group coaching challenge. And what we did was we created a strategy for um, for influencing the culture of the organization in such a way that they could connect better with their younger employees. And general managers typically are in the like 40 to 55 year age range. And they had a very difficult time connecting with uh, millennials and, and Gen Ys, like in the 20 to 30 year old age range. And that connection is really important because as you know, meaning is the new money and younger employees will simply walk away. They understand we live in an age of abundance now. We don't have to fight for jobs. We can just go find another one. And more often than not, they actually can. So we shifted the strategy from a, from a talent retention strategy to a connect with your people and love them strategy. And that, tend, that seemed to work really, really well. They're very happy with that. That was about a year ago and I'm getting excellent reports. Uh, and that's a really great challenge that simple coach uh, or non-advisory coaching is not going to be equipped to manage. Last case study, breaking stereotypes. I have a young Emirati woman CEO as one of my coaches. She's unbelievably clever. She's very smart, uh, but physiologically, she's short uh, from a from terms of uh, of her age. She's young to be in her role, and so she was wearing this label young emirati woman as a negative label so she would look at herself in the mirror and say you're too young you're too emirati you're a woman and all of those things were negative they were they were not just perceived as derogatory from the culture in which she's working but perceived as derogatory from herself when she was saying those things to herself and about herself and tell me what you know what 
uh, person in her life can she tell? I asked her, I said, who have you talked to about this? She's like, my mom, she's very encouraging. Um, I've talked to my a couple of my friends, they're very encouraging, but they don't have any tools to help me. And what I did was I helped her to, dis to, to, to take apart each of those labels and understand them as a strategic advantage for the organization, not just for her, right? So we know that... Um, uh, young people tend to be more more flexible, more um, uh, they're less averse to risk. Uh, they tend to be more the more spongy in terms of their their ability to learn, and their neuroplasticity tends to be better. So the youth is actually an advantage in terms of flexibility, as long as you're willing to take advice from people that have a lot more education or a lot more experience than you. So I said, as long as your mind is open to input, young is an advantage. If your mind is closed to input, young is a disadvantage because you don't have as much education or experience. Okay, so if your mind is open, great. And so we measured that. Do you have a fixed or growth mindset? We went through some uh, input on that. Uh, and then we talked about being Emirati. There is a massive nationalization policy in the United Arab Emirates, as there is in, in many other countries, where they want locals to have really high key, uh, key positions. And I helped her to understand that from a, from a not from a business perspective, but from a um, national perspective, that is a strategic advantage. The strategic advantage is that if things become turbulent in the region or in this area of the world or in the country, having locals in key roles in private businesses or in government offices adds stability. It's a good idea, right? So even if some of it is proactive, um, absolutely, it's a strong thing. And women in her industry are rare. So having a woman in the industry and at that top level allows for a different kind of thought uh, in, in terms of attacking the, the industry's challenges or the, the company's opportunities in, in, in those challenges. And it adds a different layer of thinking to the organization. And any CFO will tell you that the only free lunch in finance is diversification of investment, right? The more different things you diversify in, the more stable your investment is. And that's the same thing in input seeking behavior and decision making behavior. Uh, the only free lunch in decision making behavior is diversification of input. So, if you have a board of directors, for example, that's all middle aged Indian men, they're going to say it, this operates pretty smoothly. We don't really need any coaching. And I'll say exactly right because you have one brain among you, right? You are all grew up in the same culture, speak the same language, watch the same TV show programs, you have the same cultural biases probably, and so it's gonna be very smooth. What you wanna do is you wanna upset the smoothness in those decision-making bodies by introducing something different, something diverse. And the diversification of, uh, of input or experience or socioeconomic background or religious background or linguistic background or gender, is a very easy way to improve the quality of decision-making. It does increase the level of friction in the decision-making process, but it does also increase the level of uh, quality in those decisions. And that's why McKinsey and a couple of other of the big four uh, studies have found that over the last 10 years, those organizations that invest in gender balance and decision-making bodies uh, in their organizations benefit on the bottom line about 7% in the year following those, those investments. So I helped her to understand that young Emirati and woman are all strategic advantages for the organization. And as a result of her being where she is, there's a default to profitability that she is experiencing. There's a uh, an advantage, a financial advantage to her being there. That framework helped her tremendously. She became far more competent, far more confident. She has a massive strategy for her own uh, personal development outside of the organization. Uh, we're, we're tackling incredible education for her so that she can become just an absolute wizard in her industry because uh, she never wants to hear that she's pretty good for a young Emirati woman. She wants to hear about her that she is pretty good, period, globally. And so we're working on that strategy. So now rather than competing with other people that are in her industry, in her market, she is benchmarking herself uh, inside of her industry at a global level. So that that kind of thing is the the sort of thing that a, an executive coach can help with and um, and highlights, I think, I hope, the importance for CXOs to have CXO level coaches. All right, so that's the end of, of two. I understand we're running out of time now. We've got about five minutes. I wanna make sure that you grab this ebook. Please 
The ROI calculations are in there. There's four of them. If there's anything that I can do to disambiguate those for you, write to me. Reach me on LinkedIn. I'm not difficult to find. And I will help you if I can because, well, let's face it, right? A rising tide raises all the boats. I am happy just to add value to your life in terms of the coaching uh, strategy for your organization, even if I don't coach for you. Because the more organizations that understand the, the uh, profitability and benefits of executive coaching, the more that conversation becomes louder. And if that conversation becomes louder and people in this area of the world recognize what the West and North America have already been profiting from, and they say, yeah, you know what, Olympic level athletes need Olympic level coaches, we need to do that. Well, that demand is going to come back to me anyway. So I'm going to get some benefit from this as long as you become more informed and more equipped to educate your C-suite about executive coaching, about its uh, impact on the organization, its impact on themselves and their career and their com competence and confidence levels, uh, and ultimately onto the bottom line, which is what we're actually looking for. We want to make sure that whatever we're investing in has a massive ROI. And I can tell you in all of the organizations in which I work, I operate with not less than a 10x ROI in any of them. And so I'm just, I'm thrilled to be able to share this with you. We've got four minutes left for a few questions. Go ahead. So Dr. Cody, so um, there's a question on, uh, can you discuss the importance of cultural sensitivity and understanding organizational dynamics and coaching C-suite executives? This is a really, really good question, actually. Um, <clears throat> look, uh, there's a there's a spectrum, right, between cultural sensitivity and globalization. So oh, let me just stop sharing this so you can see me. There, that's better. Um, so there's this, there's a spectrum between you know globalization, which means no cultural sensitivity at all. There's there's industry benchmarks, industry behaviors. This is how we behave. This is you know from an industry level, from a global perspective. And then over here, there's the cultural sensitivities of religion, language, um, even just how to greet people when you walk into the room. Like there's massive gaps in that. And I think from a coaching perspective, the coach should be aware of that. So I took training about ten years ago on how to lead intercultural teams. Uh, I speak four languages. I've started companies on three different continents. I've worked as a consultant and a strategist and a coach in more than 30 different countries. Um, and that, yes, it is an absolute advantage when I can help people at the CXO level to recognize that, hey, you know, this conflict might be stemming from something cultural. Were I not educated in that, did not, if you know, I, I've spent five years in Yemen, I spent eight years in Estonia, I've been 12 years in the Middle East. And if I didn't have that experience, I might not notice those things as cultural. And it, I think it's really important to have a coach that has some understanding of intercultural communication and intercultural capacities, because um, if they don't, they might just say, oh, yeah, this is an interpersonal conflict. And it's not often an interpersonal conflict. I found that there's actually very few truly evil people in the world. And the majority of people, in fact, almost all of the CXOs that I've ever met are really just good people doing the best they can with what they have. And sometimes when they can't communicate with each other, it's because of a cultural bias or some sort of historical or religious bias that they have that they're not addressing and they can't see. So I think maybe more important than um, cultural competency is the ability to understand heuristics and biases in thought and how those things become frames. So yeah, maybe just a little bit of basic psychology and framing a little CBT and NL, NL, uh, NLP would help with that, even if you don't do intercultural studies. Sure. Um, so Amit is asking uh, that he's uh, been through a lot of uh, He's experienced a lot of these uh, coaching and uh, consultant. He's part of a consultancy. So he's asking that how do you tailor coaching approaches to accommodate different personality types and leadership styles within the C-suite? Yeah, look, I have I have certain tools that I use. I'm very competent in Berkman, DISC, Strengths Finder. My favorite is still uh, MBTI. So become competent in those typologies. When you understand different typologies on the in the organization even if the c-suites even if the executives themselves don't take the tests after a little while you can become competent enough that you can look at their behavior listen to the words and say ah oh, i know where this is coming from this is coming from that personality type he's a he's an istj oh istjs are notoriously cold their battery runs out really quickly and as soon as their battery runs out they become really frustrating to deal with 
They just become cold and calculated, no emotion. They don't have any empathy at all. And so you can do that. You can shorthand that by using some of the psychology tools that are out there. And they're not difficult to learn. It just takes a little time and practice. So I think it's, it's, it is responsible coaching for a coach to understand the basics of psychology and personality typology. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, we uh, we're, uh, we're, it's, it's two o'clock, we are on time, but can we take two more questions if uh, that is okay? Yeah, that's fine. I'm I'm here for you. It, I want to add as much value as I can. Sure. So there's a question from Joyita. She's asking, how do you convince your leaders who need coaching themselves in a startup to mid-size organization to have executive coaches for the CEO, HR, and COO? Yeah, so you want to go to them with this with the analogy. The sports analogy I found to be the most powerful. I walk in and say, hey, you know, your people are really talented. Yeah, really talented. Man, they might be Olympic level athletes in this industry. Yeah, they're like Olympic level athletes. And I say, name me one Olympic athlete that shows up to the Olympics without an Olympic coach. Just one. A simple illustration or metaphor like that typically gets them to think differently about the entire industry. Oh yeah, right, coaching. Okay, then you highlight the things that I've highlighted in the in the book, the CEC book, those seven differentiators. You say, look, there's no such thing as an Olympic athlete without an Olympic coach. We are playing at this level in this game. We need a coach. We need a coach because that's how we're gonna win. Right. There's no look, Olympic athletes are breaking Olympic world records all of the time. Right. A world record is by definition something that no human has ever done before. That's what makes it a world record. OK, does that make sense to you? So world records are something that no human has ever done. The only way an athlete does something that no human has ever done is because they're with a coach that's helping them to work on tactics that have never been tried before. They're so competent in the game and so connected with that athlete, they can say, actually, you know what? This might be the advantage that you're looking for. And if you do this, maybe you'll accomplish something that no human has ever done before. And this is especially important when you're dealing with the innovation of startups, right? You've got a startup and a young ecosystem. And yeah, you want their leaders to behave at their natural best. Well, if you want them to behave like athletes, treat them like athletes, if you've got a talented kid on the high school football pitch and he's running around, he's a little bit faster than all the other kids and he's kicking a little bit more accurately than the other kids on the, on the football field, what do you do? What's the, what, what is the responsible reaction to seeing talent on the field? You get him a coach. You put him on a professional team and you say, hey, listen, here's your professional coach. And that's the only way it's going to, those athletes are going to drive themselves to perform at their natural best. And that's the same in every industry including business. Business is the only industry I'm aware of where the narrative about coaching has turned to, well, we don't really need it because we're at a level where, you know, I don't, there's nothing really more I can learn at this level. And I think that is just unbelievably dangerous. If you're, if, if you're, you need to be able to measure the improvement of your CXOs, first of all, okay, right? But it, And if your CXOs aren't improving as a result of their executive coaching, you have the wrong coach first. Secondly, if your CXOs are refusing coaching, you have the wrong CXO. Anyone who can look outside at the market, at the, the world, at, at their industry, at artificial intelligence and the way that it's transforming every industry, anyone that can look out at the world and say, you know what, I don't really need to develop. I don't need to be improved. There's really nothing more that can help me to become better. That is the wrong person to be leading your organization. First of all, you have to challenge that. Not for their sake only, right? Yes, they will develop as a result of good coaching, but for the sake of the thousands of families that are in their care. If a CEO makes one bad decision, you can lose 100 families out of your economic tribe. That is way too high of a price to pay for arrogance. There is no CXO in the world that doesn't that wouldn't improve with with a good coach. And that is true in 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 every game, in every industry. I hope the the sports metaphor works for you just choose a sport right cricket right you, you play a lot of cricket where you are use that there's no high level professional national cricket player that wakes up in the morning and says you know what i'm so good at cricket i just am not gonna i'm not gonna listen to my coach anymore or i don't need coaching anymore 
right? You take the highest level football players in the world, like Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo, and they're not waking up thinking, oh, you know what? I'm such a good football player. I've won the Ballon d'Or so many times. I just don't need a coach. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And business is the only, the only industry on the planet where I see that kind of thought life. And it is just abjectly false. I hope that helps. You need to challenge your CXOs. And then if they really struggle with it, but they're kind of willing to take some input, you can give them the CEC ebook, which they probably won't read, but better off, get them in front of a good coach. Get them in front of me or Marshall Goldsmith or Mark Thompson or Stephen M.R. Covey. Like we've got really great people that come in and out of this region all the time. Get them in front of a really good coach just for half an hour and say, hey, listen, if I was to improve, if I was to be better, how can I be better? A good coach will be able to do that in half an hour. Thank you, Dr. Corey. I'll take the last question. Um, sure. It is from Chayan. He's asking, what are the basic and advanced traits that a good coach should possess to be highly effective? That's a really good question. The basic traits, you have to have, I think, a, a really good learning posture. Oh, let's put it like this. Okay, so in my in my latest book, um, my my last my latest book is called Love at Work, uh, the Final Frontier of Empathy in Leadership. In that book, I created a shorthand for active listening. So active listening has a number of steps and process, blah blah blah. I I think you can shortcut all of that with care and curiosity. If a good coach cares about their coachee and is curious about their coachee's level of play and how to improve it. That is the most basic attitude of a coach. You have to care and you have to be curious. Curious enough, not just to help them to improve, but to help you improve so that they can improve. And remember, coaches in every industry are also working on themselves. They're working on their craft. A good Olympic coach isn't just waiting from one athlete's meeting to another athlete's meeting. No, no, no. They're reading the New England Journal of Medicine. They're learning the best in nutrition, the best in sports therapy, the best in physiology. They're looking at new fMRI research on, on mindset, right? So a good coach is curious, not just about improving that particular athlete's level of play, but in improving the possibility of, of all athletes' level of play in that particular game. So those are the, that's the shorthand for the basics, care and curiosity. At a higher level, I would say you need, you need business acumen and experience. You need business education. And you need to supplement that with psychology and mindset learning. You have to have tools in that. And one set of tools or one certification is too narrow. You can't just say, hey, I'm a certified NLP coach and go in with that as your entire basket of psychology. I can tell you with a number of certifications, I'm drawing from all of them. None of them is sufficient for, for my coaching roster. So have a coach that's consistently curious and consistently cares about, about people not and not just about their coaches, but about those that are in their coaches care. I love that uh, my coaching roster represents right now just over 300,000 employees. And so the influence that I have on the CXOs that I deal with, that cascades into improving the level of, you know, the culture and communication in the organizations that they're in, which has a secondary or tertiary influence on the quality of life for each of those 300,000 employees and their families. And I'm really proud of that. So that's what I care about. Um, but yeah, care, curiosity, and then competency and capacity.